we are honored to welcome our first Caribbean Connections guest, an attorney, political party leader, junior parliamentarian, former minister of government, and proud mother. Yes, Miss Joanne Messiah of Antigua and Barbuda. Good morning, Miss Messiah, and welcome to Good Morning SKN. Good morning. Good morning to both of you. Good morning to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda. Those who are joining via the several social media platforms and those far afield. And if you just allow me just to shout out some of my favorite people in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, that would be Roslyn, H Hazel, Dwyer, and Tamalyn. There are others, oh. but I don't have enough time to list everybody. <laughs> so I'll just list my top four. <laughs> yes. Indeed. So we'll begin this way. Yesterday was World Food Day, and you are credited with developing the school meals program in Antigua and Barbuda. How important is it for children to have proper nutrition for learning? Thank you so much for that question. And indeed, we did celebrate World Food Day yesterday. And um, it is very important uh, because there have been numerous studies done the world over and right here in our region, which uh, indicates very clearly that there is a critical and crucial link between good nutrition and learning. Um, and uh, particularly in the times in which we live, just coming off of the heels of an intense yes. pandemic, we're still yes. in the pandemic, um, but where, you know, there were several lockdowns, schools were closed, those countries which are fortunate to have school meals program provide a critical uh, nutritional support base, particularly for children who come, come from deprived and depressed socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, families, communities. And during the lockdown, um, I know here in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, a lot of children would have been at a disadvantage, although uh, the government in some of the most needy communities they did take meals to the communities so that children could be better served. And so um, we also have to understand um, um, programs such as, as National School Meals Program provide excellent markets for our local food produ producers, our crop and livestock farmers, our agro-processors. And here again, it, it, it demonstrates quite clearly that all of the sectors of our economy are linked and interlinked. Sometimes, you know, we have uh, persons in government, ministers, for example, who behave as though their ministries are silos, that they are, you know, um, onto themselves. But every single thing in life is linked. And, and so I think um, school meals or just food production generally is an excellent example yeah. of how critical it is to our, our, our economy on a whole. All right, Ms. Messiah, um, you worked as a parliamentarian for 15 years and you've held several portfolios, including trade, agriculture, and uh, some areas of foreign affairs even. Uh, what would you say working with these different portfolios has taught you about yourself and about the people of Antigua and Barbuda? Um, I think I just repeat in part what I just said. It has taught me that it has re underscored really that adage that we grew up with, that no man is an island and no woman is an island for that matter. Yes. Um, and, and so my experience and exposure to stakeholders uh, in these several portfolios, again, underscored for me just how critical trade foreign affairs, agriculture, education, intellectual property, for example, they are so critical to how uh, those people we elect, those leaders we elect, um, um, advance our country and our economies and our people. Uh, because unless we have a clear idea um, as to where uh, we're taking our respective countries, unless we understand fully the need to, to reorganize, to redevelop, to, to refashion our economies, our educational systems, uh, how we interface with each other in the sub-region and the broader CARICOM, how we interface with um, countries and leaders further afield, how we leverage 
our foreign affairs to the betterment of our people above and beyond what sadly has, has, has been a practice where we just beg a little computer here, we beg this, we beg that. Our, the strength of our foreign affairs, I don't think, has been fully appreciated by our, our governments, particularly in the sub-region. Oh. Ms. Messiah, you are currently the leader of the Democratic National Allegiance Party. So that's Antigua and Barbuda's newest political party. Yes. Also, through your involvement in the Caribbean Institute of Women in Leadership, CWIL, do you see more opportunities for women participating in leadership and politics? Sure, certainly. Um, yes, and it's Demo na the Democratic National, National Alliance. Alliance. Yes. Alliance, yes, Alliance. Yes, yes. Allegiance. Yes. I apologize. Yes, <laughs> Alliance. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, certainly. Um, I think we recognize the world over, certainly in our region, the critical role that women have traditionally played in our politics. Uh, but, but unfortunately, we have been led to believe that the best place for us is to play a supporting role in the campaigns, in, yeah. in ushering in men into positions of leadership uh, and management and responsibility. And uh, But for us women, I dare say, uh, a lot of the leaders we've had would not have been where they are. Um, and, and I think we are past the time when it is both ripe and right, as I like to say, for women to take our rightful places in the governance of our respective countries. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same in St. Kitts and Nevis, that women comprise the majority numerically uh, in our countries. Women um, are the backbone of society, churches, um, trade union movements, um, politics, political parties, our communities. We are the bedrock of our societies. And to the extent that we've been, been groomed, the way we're socialized with these gender-specific roles that I hope no longer obtain as they did when I was growing up, uh, we are suitably um, trained and groomed for leadership. Uh, and I think when I look around many sectors, education, uh, IT, for example, even manufacturing, um, I see women at the forefront of these sectors and in many organizations. And I think the progression to politics is a natural one. And, and so I expect to see in short order more women being elected to our respective parliaments across our region. We hear a lot about creative economy. Is this an area where you see women and young people benefiting? Creative economy. Surely, absolutely. I, I think uh, the creative economy uh, falls under the broad banner of the orange economy. And the orange economy has always been with us. It has been, us, been with us in our cultural expressions, our carnivals, our festivals, uh, our craft uh, vendors. Um, we see it on our beaches. We see it in our tourism product, which primarily drives many of our economies in the sub-region. And, and it is here I recognize and continue to be in awe of and impressed by the innate creativity of our people. And our people in this regard have primarily been women. And so I see uh, the creative economy, as you describe it, the orange economy, as the best place for the emergence of new talents, new leaders, both among women and especially among our young people. And so I think... Um, once we get our governments to understand that linkage, which I spoke about earlier, um, and, and understand that this untapped, underdeveloped, and under-resourced uh, sector uh, needs to be right-sized, I believe it is here and then that we will see um, a greater diversification of our economy, we will see greater returns uh, for investments when we make it in our people and um, a, a better tourism product, if you will. The, the, the orange economy 
is the third last largest growing economy globally. Hollywood is a perfect example of the creative economy, the orange economy. And I'm not sure why historically our leaders have missed this, but we are in a new time, a new space. Uh, the world has become smaller with globalization. And I trust that um, the, 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 the stakeholders in this, this sector will begin to shout louder uh, to our respective governments to make those necessary uh, investments in, in them and in that sector. Mm, Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Now for a look, now for, I think this is gonna be my favorite question. We know yes. you're a mother of two sons. Yes. Do you find it challenging to balance your career causes and advocacy all while being a mother okay so so um i think for me it has had its challenges okay. but it has not been overwhelming simply because i have been fortunate to have a very supportive family network which That's would tough. include god god parents uh and so my children um, grew up with a lot of surrogate mommies um, <laughs> around nice, them. Nice. And so they helped to keep my private life in yes. check and in yes. balance. Now, I, I, I also have to say there is really no substitute uh, for you being present uh, in your children's lives. And I there think it's not. just a matter of how you balance. Yes. Um, so you have to carve out space for family time, if as women in politics, um, we are going to ensure that we raise well-adjusted and balanced uh, children who of course will grow up to be, be well-adjusted, um, thoughtful, responsible, respectful adults. Yeah. But it, it is not without its challenges. And I think the younger your children are, uh, as women, when we get into politics, the more challenging it can be. Yes. Ms. Messiah, did you ever feel pressured uh, to prioritize your role as a mother over your other ambitions? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, as I reflect, my sons would have told me that, you know, uh, they would have reminded me that, um, you know, that I'm absent in their own way, uh, that it's nice to be picked up by, you know, Auntie Rose, by uncle, by Gaudy this, Gaudy that. But sometimes it would have been nice if mommy Aww. had picked us up, if mommy had come to the game, if mommy had watched them play a sport. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of, uh, to, to deal with my own guilt about that, I have just promised them that uh, when they have their children, I'm just going to be the best supportive nan that Aww. ever lived on the face of the earth. And I'm Aww. really working towards that. <laughs> Sounds like a fair trade off to me. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so tell us about your love for gourmet cuisine. Are you a gourmet yes. cook or do you just yes, appreciate yes, it? Yes. Oh, you are a gourmet cook? Of course. Can I come over sometime? Because I'm a foodie. When next you're in Antigua, you let me know. And once I'm, I'm, I'm available. No, I've really always taken okay. a lot of pride in my, um, my creativity okay. when it comes to cuisine. Nice. And I think that um, anybody who's listening, who's, who's sampled my cooking, would attest to that. I, I nice. think it's, it's, it's a part of the balance uh, in one's life. Um, and so, so I, I am a, I'm a vegetarian, oh, nice. uh, and I've been so for a, more years than I care to remember. Okay. Um, but I do cook, um, regular food for the non-vegetarians. Okay. Um, and I think what I do, I do well, I take pride it's in tough. it. I, I just, uh, you know, I, 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 for years I used to subscribe to food and wine magazine. And nice. so when I infuse 
you know, what I would have read with our local cuisine as well. Yes. I think I would come out on the happy end of, of that spectrum. Yes. Nice. Yes. Ooh, I'm my mouth salivating already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Masai, we have just a little bit more time, just a little bit, yes. for yes. one final question, and it is okay. this. What is your vision for developing young people in Antigua and Barbuda and the wider Caribbean? Yes. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful question. Um, I have been of the view for many years that what my country and the Caribbean needs, and I, I focus a lot on the, the, the sub-region, the OECS countries, because there is so much more commonality and sense of purpose and history and culture which unites us as a people than which divides us and i think the so-called divisions are mere artificial and superficial constructs that we have to just ignore and put behind us now where it comes to developing young people i believe that that starts in large part by a conscientious government or governments uh, prepared to restructure, refashion, re-revolutionize, if you will, our curriculum. Because our young people are the now. One of the my young colleagues reminded us just a few months ago that the young people are not satisfied to be told that the future belongs to the young people, the now belongs to them. And I agree with that completely. And so if we are to um, propel our young people to be the best of themselves, to develop, to pursue their passions, to be successful, uh, this requires uh, the educational system, as I just said, to be restructured, to be revolutionized, uh, to the point where we are teaching our young people and grooming them for the economies which we need to develop if we are to survive in this era of globalization, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have to support their passions. And their passions, I have uh, learned and I understand and I accept, no longer fit into the me mainstream educational system. Uh, one colleague reminds us from time to time that 15, 20 years ago, maybe not even that long, you say to your parents, oh, I want to be a graphic designer. I want to be an artist. I want to be a singer. You know, in typical Caribbean style, they'd say, but just, we're talking about just stop your foolishness. You need a real job. And we just spoke about the creative economy, the yes. orange economy. And it is here that you see these passions come alive. In, in, biz, in the business world today, you can hardly uh, be successful if you don't have a good brand, if you don't have um, graphics that portray the product or services which you're trying to, 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 to promote and to sell and to offer. You can no longer have have a good um, um, a business a business model if there's not a jingle to go along with it and and so I I think the way the world has evolved today is forcing us to wake up and pay attention and to realize that if we refashion and restructure in the right way uh, in a consistent and sustainable way then we would have done the best. Yeah. for our young people so that uh, their passions will become normalized and we're, we're not looking at them as the exception. And I also wish to say that as a part of the uh, revolutionization of that educational system, we need to fully embrace the technical and educational vocational model and no longer see TVET as a space for dropouts, a space for people who cannot uh, learn the mainstream uh, curriculum, who don't fit in. Because, listen, the, we, we live in houses, we work in buildings, 
Um, we drive vehicles. And I don't think any of these things are built and designed by lawyers and doctors and accountants and so on. They are built by men and women who are plumbers, who are engineers, who are designers, nice. who are plumbers, who are steel benders, who are excellent with sheet rock um, construction so that you can, in a day, knock down dry walls and redesign a space. And so um, I don't know where we came up with this idea that uh, people who are into technical and vocational, um, the, the technical and vocational trade were not smart people. They have to be some of the smartest people out there, you know, to be able to know the consistency, to keep a building yeah. together, to, 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 you know, we have a plumbing problem. Most of us would freak out. We need a plumber because we don't understand the mechanics of plumbing, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the best thing, as I said, in a nutshell, that we can do for our young people is to redesign, redevelop, restructure, revolutionize that educational curriculum and that space, yes. um, have it more of a purpose-built one that suits the broad needs of various learners so that we are training and developing enough people to be able to drive the various facets of our economies. <music>